No idea. That's so cool. Okay, we're back. So we're just gonna, this is part two. Part two of, this is the remix of the, um, of the Carmel and Wendy Let's Travel the World show. Let's try it again. We're going to try it again. And so what um, we were talking about African presence in, in um, all around the world, pretty much. And so Carmel is an educator. She's a world explorer. She's been to 17, 18 different countries. She And she only just started in 2014, right? So less than five years, you have gotten to all these countries. Yeah. Right? It's still hard for me to believe, but yes. And just for those of you who are just, you know, tuning back in, Carmel is um, also has a blog and she started blogging about her experiences traveling the world. So her blog is up here on the screen is carmelanin.com. Now carmelanin is the coolest name ever. That is so cool. <laughs> So, I'm so used to it now. It's like, oh, but yeah, it is cool. <laughs> yes, I love that name. And so she talks about her experiences uh, traveling. And so please follow her blog um, about traveling. But we'll get back into it. I'm just waiting for everything to kind of like settle down over here on the Facebook side. Um, but OK, it looks like we're back. Cool. All right. Okay. So. Um, Yes, tell us about, and I'm just gonna leave the Carmelanin part up. Tell us about, um, you know, like some of the places that you have enjoyed traveling to and the the presence of the, of Africa in those places. Um, so I, as of lately, my thing has been really to travel to Africa. Ah, um, yeah. Because, for me, it's it's very powerful to be in a country where ev pretty much everyone looks like you um, and you don't feel like you're the minority or you don't feel like people are looking at you like, you know, what are you doing here? Um, but when I do travel to other countries, I was saying like South America is always, <laughs> is always very, bless you, always you. very intriguing to me. Um, South America, we don't see black people often. And a lot of times I think we forget that they are there. And yeah. so I think Peru, which was my most recent trip, Peru really, really struck me because going to the museums, talking to the different people, they are very aware of the African presence within their country and they talk about it. Yeah. And of course, you're, you're going to have some people that are racist and some people that do not associate with the darker skinned people or black people, period. Um, I think, but that's a part of their own colonization of their mind for the most right. part. And right. so, but when we went to like the museums and everything in Peru, I was like, oh my gosh, like it, there's, it's like clear. There's no denying it. It is absolutely clear that there were African people there and they are still there. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Renoko Rashidi was actually the person that set our trip up for us. Oh. When I say set it up, he like told us where to go. Um, he kind of like set us up with someone that he knew to take us to El Carmen. El Carmen is like where the black people are in Peru. Okay. And we didn't get a chance to make it to El Carmen. However, it was funny because when we were asking the driver to take us there, he was just kind of like, you want to go there? You go there. And we right. were like, yup. Yep. <laughs> and you could tell they were kind of saying, they were saying without saying, that's the hood. Like, why do y'all want to go there? It's the hood. It's ghetto. Right. You're not going to be safe. Like that type of thing. And we were like, no, we want to go. And it was about probably like four hours outside of, um, outside of Lima. And they were going to take us, but they were just like, do you have someone to go with you? Like, it's not safe to go alone. And we did have someone, thanks to um, Brother Renoko Rashidi. But again, just being there, I was like, man, there are, there's African presence everywhere you turn. Like, there's no denying it. 
Now, you mentioned Dr. Renoko Rashidi, and hey, Tammy, welcome to the broadcast. Who is Dr. Renoko Rashidi? Rashidi? So, Dr. Renoko Rashidi, he, and this is how I got exposed to like the the Africa the African presence just worldwide. Yeah. Um, he travels to many many different um, countries around the world. I mean, he's been to several. And he travels to all these countries, and when he goes there, he locates the African presence within all these countries, and he shows everyone these pictures that he takes. And I know for me, when I first started seeing these pictures, I was like, wait a minute, you mean to tell me you're in the Philippines, and these people look like me? Yeah. They're darker than me, they got noses like this, lips like this. I was like, wait. Right. And so, he really... Um, it poses the truth from what we from what we think because what I've learned from him and what I've learned just from my own experience, um, when the colonizers came over, they pushed the African people most of the time south or toward the coast, depending on which country it was. Right. And so you don't see these people when you come to these countries. You don't see the darker skinned people or the African people. When you go to these different countries, you'll see the fair skinned people, and that's what you think is the norm, but it's really not. And so he will go like deep into the, the forest, the jungles, like he's everywhere showing you, like, no, these are the Aboriginal people of this land, the indigenous of this land, and they are the people who were here first. Even when he goes to like um, different museums, um, for a long time, I didn't want to travel to Europe, but from him and from, um, Tony Browder, I learned you can't you can't say I'm not traveling to these countries because you'll be surprised that most of our history is in these other European countries because they've stolen so much of our history and our artifacts and things and planted them in their museums. So it's like you you can't say I'm not going right. to go. You have to go because you have to see it for yourself. Right. And so you have to see it for yourself. You have to. And, and it's really important. Like when I went to France. After I went to France after we went to Kemet. And you know how in Kemet, I believe it's, I want to say it's Karnak. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's Karnak or Luxor where when you walk in, there's the uh, the Tekken that stands alone, but it's supposed to be a pair. Yeah, they stole one. They stole one. Right. When I went to France, you know, we just chilling, hanging out, having a good time in Paris in the square. And we walk up on this Tekken. You know, to some people, it's called an obelisk, but it's a Tekken. We walk she's up on it. About, the, the Tekken is the, what she's talking about is if you go to the to Washington, D.C., and you see what they call the Washington, Washington Monument, that shape with the point at the top, the original name of that is, the, the true name is a Tekken. Yes. And it's an energetic uh, shape. And it's, even in Washington, D.C., it is the, it's to a sorry, right? Isn't it a temple? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's what she's talking about. They're all over Kemet, except for they've been stolen and taken to other places, including the square where the Pope gives his speeches from. They're all over Europe. So this is what Carmen is talking about. Um, there were a lot in Kemet, but only 12 remain now. Only 12 remain in Kemet mm -hmm. now where they were originally erected. And so we're in France and we're chilling in Paris in the square and we're having a good time when we walk up on this tech in and because I've already had that, you know, pre-knowledge, I'm like, let me investigate as I'm reading and I'm looking, I'm like, this is the one. So I'm flipping out my friends. Right. Like, What's wrong with her? I'm like, right. what they stole from Kimmett? Like I'm going <laughs> right. crazy. Like I'm pissed because they actually show you how they took it. Right. And I'm like the nerd, like y'all, y'all stole it. And then put it up here and then had the nerve to say, yeah, we took it and this is how we did it. So right. just having that knowledge and under understanding what it is that you're looking at when you travel to different places, you're you're able to see it immediately. Yeah. And that's right. when I was like, OK, Carm, you can't X off all European countries, because if anything, you're going to see more of your history in those countries than anywhere. So that's what I want to put a pin there. And I want to like support that some more. So. For those of you who are just joining, I see my cousin Virginia. Hey, Star Wars cousin Virginia. Um, <laughs> we are talking about like the African presence and in European countries where they have stolen the artifacts and they just have them straight up in their 
in their um, museums. I'm like what? Like they are ours. So imagine you're sitting in your home. Somebody comes and takes the picture of your grandmama off the wall and they take it to their house. And they saying, that's not grandma. That's not grandma Mary. That's my grandmother, Maria. <laughs> no, you cannot have that picture back. No, you cannot have it back. So that's kind of like in what we're talking about. So I was saying before, for those of you who were just joining, we got cut off. We had technical difficulties. We on take two. Yes. And we were talking about some of these things. But for anybody who follows Iyanla Van Zandt, currently she is in Paris on her tour and she's going through the museums and she's been going through them with a black tour guide over the last few days. And she is, I feel like in the way that I'm hearing her talk, I feel like she's now even for herself, understanding the level of thievery <laughs> that has happened with these people stealing and having these artifacts in their museums with the noses off and with the heads cut off and all these different things. Yeah. So I saw that this morning. I don't necessarily I know. Yeah, I don't necessarily follow Iyanla's Instagram, but yeah. I saw it on somebody else's page. So I went through and I took a few minutes to look and she's seeing what we saw. Okay. She's talking about what we're talking about. And she's also making sure that the people who are watching know that it's, it's, you know, we have to be some powerful people for somebody to come through and shoot wow. our noses off and cut our heads off in these artifacts, just straight up artifacts. This is like Alexander the Great coming to, um, you know, or Napoleon, one of them fools, come in there and like sh shooting the nose off of the Haramaket, which is what people know as the Sphinx. Yeah. So, so you're right, Carm. And so Carm and I are of that same mindset. We kind of are learning and building together. And some people may consider us a little extra, like my mom would consider me a little extra, you know, but I'm not trying to, yeah, I wasn't trying to go to any European country. Because I don't want to see my stuff in other European countries, but you're right. Yeah. And Dr. Browder's right. And Dr. Rashidi is right where we can go with the lens to know the truth about what we're seeing. We have to. We have to. And when you see it with a different lens, it still angers you. I'm not going to lie. Like, it still angers right. you. It makes you very mad. Very. I was very angry when I was in Paris. But you feel grateful because you're like, most people come here not knowing this and right. they just think it's, oh, this is just normal, you right. know, and it's not. And it, it also gives you a sense of pride because it's like me, I, my people are everywhere and you right. can't take that from us. We're everywhere. And even, even other people celebrate us, whether they know it or not. So to know the truth and have that, that lens, it just makes you feel better about who you are. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, I don't know where in the translation of the first video to the second video, I was just talking about my experience in Havana, Cuba, where I was there for nine days, but like five of those days, I'm just, you know, doing the regular tour. Yeah. And this um, Dr. Roberto Torres came through with that black in Havana tour. <laughs> you were like, what? I you wish know? I got that tour. <laughs> yeah. Like, the same exact square, the same exact area, the same exact parts. He took us to where I had been the whole time. And that's my big sister. Hey, big sister, Lily Almighty. That's my real big sister. She, <laughs> um, thank you for joining us. Like, he gonna take us to the barbershop. It was just a door we didn't open. Mm -hmm. He took us to these other little markets and leather shops and garment places. It was just the door that we did not open because we had no clue because right. the regular tour guard guards were guides were not taking us to those places. Yeah. And I was just like, we were all like, ah. and you know, he gets in trouble. He has gotten in trouble in the past and, you know, for doing those types of things because oh, wow. they don't want that kind of information out. And what he was teaching us 
was that um, the darker your skin, the yeah. further away from the tourist places they would allow you. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you weren't allowed to really come into the square. You weren't allowed to do certain things unless you were serving the tourists. So, you know, you've been all around the world. Many places are set up for European tourists to enjoy. Yep. Yep. It's set up to make them feel comfortable. It's yep. set up to let them do whatever and see whatever and be on the beach and do whatever. So that is sort of like what Cuba and Havana in the squares specifically is set up to do. So you might see the little stereotypical grandma with the headscarf with the, the cigar, but you not you wouldn't typically years ago see too many other regular people who are native to the land right. out where the tourists can see them. Yeah, and for that reason, that's really why when I visit countries, you know, people just want to stay on the resort and they want to stay with, you know, within the city. Some people may say it's not safe or whatever, but honestly, we're not even safe here in America, but that's a whole nother story. I was when I go, when I go to different countries, I like to stay with, with the people, with the residents that are actually like native to the land. You learn a lot. They embrace you more. They look like you. And for me, you do feel safer. Yeah, I don't I'm not the I don't really like the not saying that it's anything wrong with it. Everyone deserves that to just be, you know, being be in, in your hotel and get up and go to the pool and, you know, live the lavish life. But for the most part, I really like to be within the neighborhood and really learn and and be with the people. So even if I have like a um, Doug and I, when we went, we did like an excursion when we were in Peru and um we connected with our driver. I mean, he was like, anytime y'all come back, like hit me up. I will take y'all anywhere y'all want to go because we were invested in his knowledge. We were like, tell us about your people. Tell us about your history. And when I say the whole four hour, two hour drive from where we, where we were, he talked to us about everything. We learned so much from him. And just the fact that we were open to hearing about his people and the war that they had with the Spaniards, like he broke everything down. Right. He was like, basically, he was like, y'all are family. Like anytime y'all come back, just take my card. Here's my number. Come back in anything y'all need. You know, it's interesting when you're open. So when I was in Thailand, I was in Bangkok. So you're talking about staying in the neighborhoods. Yeah. Lana, we stayed in the neighborhood with family. And when I was in Thailand by myself, I stayed at just an Airbnb. And it was a it was a um, a Thai lady. She was younger than me, but she had just opened up this Airbnb. So I was one of the early ones um, to stay at her facility. So she was super nice to me, and it was amazing. We had sort of a language barrier, as you would mm -hmm. understand, but. Yeah. She and her mom cooked for me every day. They didn't do that for everybody. That was never <laughs> their intent. But because we would stay up and talk, she wanted to touch my hair and understand my hair. But when we had dinner one night, she told me how we, we humanized it. Yeah. It yeah. was like the boundaries are away. We are human beings. Yeah. And we have just set up these boundaries Technically, right. we set up these boundaries and we set up reasons not to communicate with other human beings. Right. That wasn't what I went for. I went there to connect. Right. Right. So she just telling me about how she was a fashion designer and she she was dating a guy and he ghosted her. This is a little Thai lady. You would think that's like an American thing. Oh, ghosted her. Wouldn't ever return her phone calls after two years. So she was so broken hearted. She stopped doing what she was doing and wanted to live her true passion, which was to start this Airbnb. She's an, she's an interior designer and she just wanted to create all these beautiful rooms and experiences for tourists who come in. Okay. And it's not even, it's not even in this, it, it's not even on like a tourist road. It's in the cut because it's in the neighborhood. Okay. And I just felt so grateful that we were able to connect as women, as human beings. Right. She, she gave me a beautiful experience with her mom and her cooking. And we just had human experiences. Like 
she ain't telling me no story different than my sister here who's like, like, you know, it didn't go the way I want, but now I'm living my passion. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a different, it's a different vibe. It's a different experience when you do it that way. And again, it may not be for everyone. Some people are just like, nope, I'm going to the resort. It's safe. That's it. I'm not leaving. I'm not talking to people. Stranger danger. Okay. Like <laughs> that's cool. But, um, I've learned that it's a different experience when you do it that way. And so you're a teacher. Yeah. And my babies. You have, <laughs> what grade did you teach? I've taught pretty much all grades except eighth. I've taught fifth. I've taught sixth. I've taught seventh. And I'm currently teaching seventh now. Yeah. Okay. So. so, and what's the population of your students? What's the demographic? Um, uh, Latino and black. Okay. Yeah. Latino. So do you incorporate what you're learning? Because you know do. traditional traditional materials as far as history go. Well what well what do you teach though? I'm about to ask. Like I'm it could be art. Um, so I teach um ancient civilizations right now. Oh wow. and I'm, I'm just plugging up my phone so my, my phone won't die. Okay. <laughs> Um, I teach ancient civilizations, which really works out for me because I, um, you know, we've been to Kemet. And so having like that history yep. and having that background, it really works out. And so one of the things that I chose not to do is teach. Um, I don't teach about like uh, ancient Greece. I don't teach about Rome. I don't yeah. teach about anything after Egypt. Okay. Or Kemet. Okay. And, um, you know, my students have asked me, like, how come we don't learn about the other civilizations? And I told them because I don't teach about thieves. I'm not going to teach about people that steal and build their empires. <laughs> no, I keep listening. I keep it all the way funky with my kids. Like, they know. I see. <laughs> but wait a minute. What do your, what do your uh, principals and your board or whatever, what do they say about all this? They're okay with it. Oh wow! Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, my um, my my instructional coach, you know, she helps me. Like, she gives me materials that I need. Um, make sure that you know I'm good with the curriculum and everything. I've talked to her, and um, you know, she 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 asked me the same thing, and I told her I was like, you know, I'm not really big on teaching European perspective. I teach African truth in my class, and I just I have to be honest. I can't. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not right. gonna show. I'm not, I just, I can't be the one to lie to, to kids and to ask me to do that. I can't. Right. So they respect it. And I'm really grateful to have, um, to be at a school that does respect that. And so Absolutely. it's not, it's not forced upon me. It's not, I'm, I'm not forced to teach those things. Um, but yeah, we spend, we spend quite a great deal on talk about like Mesopotamia. We talk about Sumer, but we don't talk about it in a European perspective. Because, you know, they'll have to believe in that they were also Europeans, and that's not how I teach it. Um, we talk about, um, I'm trying to think. This year, I've been talking about Mesoamerica, yeah. which is not in the curriculum. So talking about uh, the Incas and talking about the Mayans and the Aztecs, the Olmecs, that's not in the curriculum. But I have Latino students that are from South America that right. share that share this lineage and they're not being taught that. So this year, last year, I felt like I did my students a disservice by not teaching it. Okay. So this year, I was like, I was more intentional about how I service my students. And so I decided to incorporate that in the curriculum. And my instructor was really excited. She pulled all types of resources. And it really helped that I went to Peru because I learned so much in Peru just about like the different cultures they don't call them tribes. They call them cultures. And there were like 25 other cultures that we don't know about. That's not right. told to us. I right. of the Incas, Aztecs, you know? Yeah. And I think the most, the most heartfelt thing, I have a student, um, he was adopted, and he's from Guatemala, but he was adopted, and um, his parents are European. And so he's having some issues this year with just like identity. Yeah. And so yesterday I went to him and I said, Hey, you know, how are you, how are you re receiving this information? And he was like, I love it. Like, mm -hmm. I love it. And I was like, does it, does it 
anger you that you don't know? Or is it helping you learn more about your people? He was like, it's very interesting. Like, I'm really happy we're learning it because I feel connected. And I was like, well, would you like to like learn more information? And I can give you things personally, just we can yeah. just talk about things personally and, and research different stuff. And he was like, yeah, I would love that. So that makes me feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Here's a kid who doesn't know much about his roots as our black students don't. He's, right. he's, been, he's been disconnected from that, but he was proud to say, I'm Mayan. My people are Mayan. And when he's learning about it and he's hearing like how great they were and the things that they did and how they accomplished stuff and how they're still thriving today and how they have other languages outside of Spanish. Wow. He's, like you can see that he's proud. So you, know? you give the stuff to his parents too? Because it would be great for his parents to know this too. That, that I never considered, but that is a good idea. Yeah. Um, I, I never considered that, like also inviting them into it as well. And, and really it's just a matter of if they're willing to receive it too. And I, I'm sure they would, you know, yeah. I'm sure they would very much be open to it, but we, we're just starting this um, particular part of the curriculum. So yeah. I haven't gotten there yet. Cause if, I feel like as an adoptive person, when you're, I'm, I'm an adoptee one, but when yeah. you're an adoptive parent and you decide to choose a child from another race than you at, or another culture that you could at the very least consider learning information about that child's family. So maybe that's just my little two cents on, you know, because I, I, I know just from being an advocate for adoption and being um, an advocate for the adoption of black families with black babies, Yeah, that so many of them as they grow up, just like this little boy, they have this identity crisis and they don't understand who they are. And they have these parents who, though they love them, they don't understand the nuances of being in this world and in this life. And um, I think a little bit of education is uh, could, could go a long way to having him preserve his mental and emotional and spiritual well-being moving forward. Because a lot of them, they struggle when they haven't been raised by somebody that no, the love we're not talking love, we're talking culture. Yeah. Because most of the time, the love is there, but it's the cultural piece and those little nuances like, you know, my mom used to do private adoptions and she would have these other races of people adopt children. They didn't know how to do the hair. Yeah. You know, it's those little things that you don't think about that you don't know. So right. that totally off the subject, but I'm just saying for you, no, but it's it'd true. be something to consider. A part of education. Yeah, it's true because you know he gets he gets frustrated when he hears his friends speaking Spanish and he's like he doesn't understand or when they talk about the foods and just the culture and he can't connect he gets really frustrated and we see that and so what you're saying is absolutely right but right. that you know thank you that is something that I will consider not even consider that I will do moving forward just presenting them with material too, because he's, he's very proud. I can tell, like, he's like front of the class, he's front and center, he's looking, he's engaged, you know, you can just see the, the sense of connectivity that he's having. Right. And I would say, um, I totally lost my train of thought, but yeah, I think that's cool. I think that's a cool way to, um, to help bolster his whole self-esteem because I'm pretty sure I had a great thought, but I just can't remember it. It's fine. I definitely it's feel like there is a, that is definitely a way to just give him some peace. Oh, I know what I was going to say. <laughs> so Mbwebe, who is one of the guests who's on our show, he's our brother that traveled to Kemet with us as well. Hey, and bro. What I learned recently, recently as of like two days ago, and I already told Mbwebe this, but for your student and even for us yeah. when you travel and when you go. So now um, both Carm and Bwebe and I have done our African ancestry test over the years. I did mine in 2007. They have done theirs more recently, but we all partly have our heritage and lineage in Cameroon in Africa, right? And so what I have learned recently two days ago, is that when, <laughs> when you're able to say the language and speak those words of the culture that you come from, 
your body starts to heal, your body starts to remember, your DNA starts to change and to purify because it's not used to those sounds, but it re but it's in your DNA, so it'll start to remember. Oh wow! So I got what the the this is on my maternal side. It's for full day. That's the language of the Mafa people in Cameroon. So I got a website that has some of the words. I'm talking basic stuff. I can say thank you. I can say you're yeah, welcome. That, yeah, <laughs> I will pass it on because I'm just thinking about it since Embuebe's here and I'm looking at you here. We're all Cameroonian of Cameroonian descent. Mm -hmm. And for this little boy, he's upset because he doesn't know how to speak certain language. But once he starts to speak it, it'll start to come. Now, I'm not saying we're going to be just fluent or whatever. And I'm not saying we won't be. But what I'm saying is when we start to say those words, things in our bodies changes energetically because that's where we're from. It was just taken away. Sort Absolutely. of like the artifacts in the museums. Absolutely. If from a certain place, it was just taken away. And always... always when I'm doing my, the sanctuary radio shows or my whole mission is to educate and empower and inspire, but it's also to help us awaken and heal. And when you awaken, when you awaken this little boy to this information and his family, it's going to heal him in a way that he's never known before. It has been very healing for me over the last 12 years to know that I have Cameroonian lineage. Now I know I have Sierra Leonean lineage. And now I also know I have German lineage. Okay. That I need to figure that out too. So that's really the whole point. So to be able to travel the world, to open yourself up, to see other cultures, to see people who look like you, to eat different foods and to have different experiences is also very healing because if you stay here in this little bubble and if you're on the CNN news cycle all day, every day, if you listen to music and listening to the news that drives you crazy, if the people at work are getting on your nerves, you're not going to be healed. That's right. You're going to be sick, just like what is the statistics of us who put up with the stress from being here all the time. Sometimes you just got to get away. You do. And Carm and I are saying world travel past Miami, <laughs> past Jamaica, Mexico, past <laughs> Vegas, past those. Not a judgment, just a consideration. <laughs> Get past those and go see something else. And it could it could literally change your life. Yeah, it's definitely not judgment. More, more than anything, it's motivation. Yeah. Like, Motivate yourself to go see other things, like step outside of that box or step outside of that bubble and really push yourself to go to travel somewhere else and, and see something different. And I promise you, once you start, like you literally will not want to stop. Right. So you said your next trip is? Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. And then if people want to follow you, we're on, you're on carmelin.com, but then your, um, your Instagram, cause you're pretty, you're pretty active on Instagram too, right? So all of my handles are carmelinin. My, my Facebook is carmelinin demand. My Instagram is at carmelinin. My Twitter is carmelinin underscore. Cause surprisingly somebody has at carmelinin. So I just put an underscore, Okay, um, but yeah, so all my handles are carmelinin. Okay. okay. And yeah. so for those of you who would love to see a young woman just traveling the world, like anytime <laughs> you're going to see her going all these different places and she takes beautiful pictures and she went with her partner on the last one and they had like spiritual experiences together. And then, you know, she's coming home and she's teaching these babies and she's going to be teaching her own baby soon. So yeah. it's just really, it's a really beautiful thing to be able to watch her as her big sister and be able to just see her, you know, moving and growing and exploring and sharing the information. And she does it unapologetically. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> she does it unapologetically because she has, you know, she has chosen to absorb and consume and to seek out information that not everybody does. 
Yes. And to process it in a way that she shows that she loves herself and she loves us black people. That's right. So apologetic. Follow <laughs> yes. Follow her. And um, do you have any last things, any last comments you'd like to share? I know we had some te technical difficulties, but I feel like we pulled it out. We pulled it out. Yeah, it worked out. Um, not really. I mean, just again, travel with purpose. Um, some people for, for many people that may look different for me is traveling to seek out African presence and coming back and sharing that with family, friends and my students. Yeah. Um, for other people, it may be to build, start some type of initiative in different countries. But I just really think like the more we help each other in these different countries, the more that we are propelling each other to be great and to be better. And a lot of times when you travel to these different countries and you connect with with people, they are looking for people to come and start businesses and do different things in their communities. But it's like, we have to get on it. Like we really have to start, especially on the continent in Africa, like we really have to start getting the ball rolling because everyone else is going to Africa and investing and there's not enough of us. And then we can't, we can't get mad and say, oh, well, they're, they're giving things away to China or they're giving things away to Russia or, or whomever when they don't see us. So money right. talks. So whoever's coming, that's who is, that's who's able to establish their businesses and right. really establish their own community. So yes, traveling to the continent more, getting the notion out of your mind that Africa is not safe or Africa, I can't go there and, and be comfortable, please. Africa is beautiful. Yeah. Uh, many different countries in Africa are, are really being developed and, you know, tourism matters. Like if we travel to these different countries in Africa more, um, yeah. that, that helps them with their infrastructure. That helps them with just generating more capital to continue building things. So um, that's like always my push now, traveling to Africa more. So if you haven't been to the continent, please uh, start making your way there. Ghana yeah. this year will probably be like the place to go. Yeah. Because that's the, the year of return, um, the 400th year that our people have been stolen and brought here to America, the transatlantic slave trade. So it, it would definitely be a good time. Take your friends, take your family and go and, and enjoy it. Right. And just to, um, just to just support that and add another thing that a lot of people don't know, but I've been keeping an eye on really closely is that if you don't have your passport, I would suggest getting it as soon as possible. What is happening um, is that the government is going to stop you from getting your passport and from going to all these different places. They're calling 2020. 2020 is about to be a whole nother situation. The 5G situation is creating a whole new situation. Energetically, 2020 is a whole new kind of... Um, Going, it's like a quantum leap of energetic changes and changes for people and places and things that um, we've never seen before. Every now and again, there is a leap that happens and this rush of technology and energy and all these different things. And it's not if you believe it or not, it just is what it, it is. What it is. And either flow with it or you or you suffer, it, right. you know, you get left behind. And so the Healthy People 2020 initiative is one of those things where if you're not vaccinated, so you know how they used to only vaccinate the babies and then people stopped letting their babies get vaccinated. So now what they're doing is trying to make you take your flu shot at work. Yep. And if you don't take your flu shot, then you can't have a job. They're trying to give your baby the HPV shot. Now that's a teenager because they didn't take them when they were little. So now they're trying to don't let them come to school unless they get the HPV shot when they're over 13. So these are just little ways that they're going to stop you from getting your passport. And then they're going to not let you go out of the country. And then they're not going to let you work. And it's not a theory. It's not like a woo-woo. It's real straight up. I study it. I know. And that's why I like to share it. You can take it or don't. This is the truth. Yeah. So get your passport. Get your documents ready. Even if you don't plan to go, we suggest you go. It'd be beautiful <laughs> you to go wherever you want to go Africa or otherwise but they were starting to test the waters just recently in Rockland County in New York some 
people came down with the measles. I think it was the Hasidic Jewish population that came down with the measles. They were going to stop them from going to school, from the store, from the library, from Ma, from temple, all those things. They were going to stop it. And then people started to protest. And then it wow. didn't happen. You can Google Rockland County vaccinations, but these are just the little ways that they're stepping out to see how we gonna react or not, right? Wow. So don't be caught with not being able to get your passport to go for pleasure or if you just got a roll. That's right. So I just wanted to drop that on my, you know, on, on everybody. And um, another thing, if you just, Africa is vast. Take an African ancestry test. Figure out where you're from. That was what I did. I did not want to go out of, um, I didn't want to just go to Africa because I could go to Africa. I wanted to step my first foot in a place of my, of my family. So I did. And from 2007, it took me to 2015 to go. But I finally went and I even took a picture of my foot stepping on the <laughs> land and the time I marked the time and everything of me stepping on the land of my mother's 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 mother. That's cool. So, um, if you feel like Africa is too big and you don't want to go because you just don't want to go, take your test and then you can choose to maybe go there first and then you can go to other places. So that's even if, even if that is not the first, we can think about Kemet too because that's like the birth of civilization and everything. And it's yeah. funny that you say you like took a picture of your foot because my Chuck Taylors that I wore in Kemet, I I never wore them again. Like they're in a bag stored away, and I plan to like get them cased and everything. I'm like, these these shoes touch the grounds of like. So I'm like, nope, I'm never wearing them again. They're all dusty from all the walking around we did in the desert. But yeah, yeah definitely ha with that purpose, whether it's through your test, whether it's through going to Kemet first and saying I yeah. want to go to where like our ancestors originated, like. You can do it that way too. It's true. Yeah, and that's what I did. I went to Cameroon first, and then nine months later, I went to Kemet. Oh wow! I didn't know it was that yeah. close together. Yeah, nine months later, then I went to Kemet. I said, I want to see where I'm from first, and then I want to see where civilization started. Right. And a lot of you will say, Well, I'm from West Africa. I'm from Nigeria. I'm from whatever. There were six to eight migrations, east to west. Yes, we're all family. Yes, we're all, we're all connected yes. in some kind of a way. So don't let that be a deterrent either. Don't let that stop you. That east to west thing. Yeah, started in the east, it went to the west. That's some right. of the symbols and things are that we find in the east were we found in the west. How so, Tony Crowder say it? From the Nile to the Niger. That's how right. they traveled. Yeah. Right. So from Waset to Wakanda. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to just thank you, Carm, for joining me. Thank you for rolling through the technical difficulties. Cool. I want to thank everybody who joined us on this. And if you see this later, we had a lot of ups and downs on the first and the second, but we hope that it was made sense and that it wasn't too disjointed. Thank you for your time. Follow Carmelanin.com. Um, yes. And follow... Um, also, Awaken and Heal, which is my um, Instagram. And then also my website at goddess-awaken.com because my whole point is to inspire, empower, and, you know, inspire and empower and help women unapologetically transform into their most authentic and healthy selves by tapping into the goddess that they were born with. It's already there. Yes. And But when you heal a woman, you heal a nation. That's why I focus her. on yes to heal the world so, <laughs> thank you everybody and i will see you the next time in the sanctuary and thank you for flowing peace Cindy. peace